Let me know if you don't, and I can make you a co-host. You don't see my screen? Yep, looks good. Cool. All right. Well, thank you all for having me at the meetup. Um, this is my talk, Leveraging Accessibility and Usability to Serve Truly Diverse Audiences. One, I grew up listening to a lot of Fallout Boys, so that's why the talk name is so long. And two, I wanted to uh, address a lot of buzzwordy things that we often talk, to, talk about in tech. So it's also known as breaking through buzzwords and creating a uh, foundation that everyone is going to truly benefit from. So about me, I am a technical project manager and front-end developer over at Brightform. I live in Dallas, Texas, and I've been in Drupal since 2014, 2015, 2015, when I was working for the city of Dallas, and that's actually where the first iteration of this talk came from. So that's about me. My question, if anybody chooses to answer it, uh, who are you? So for me, like I am Taryn Almendarez, live in Texas. I'm a black woman who is college educated, had two parents that both went to college. So I got places where I'm marginalized and I've got places where I experience uh, privilege. So if anybody wants to share things in the chat about themselves, that's cool. I know we did a little bit of a introduction earlier, but and while people choose to respond or not, we'll move on to the next part, which is a pop quiz. This one I would like for y'all to answer. Either you can shout out answers or put it in the chat. So for you, what is diversity? Diversity is where, um, regardless of uh, what you do, who you are, what color you are, or anything, that's true diversity. I would take rather uh, rather than like in. Um, development uh, environment, if you take uh, a person who is uh, developing on a Linux environment and uh, wants to get into Windows or Windows environment and wants to get into Linux, that's one way of diversity. But if you look at it as a whole, it's whoever you are, you're a person, a human being, you're Thanks, diverse. Fonda. I see Peter shared in the chat, diversity is when a group doesn't have a uniform culture and outlook. I would say diversity is people not like me. I go to too many meetups full of uh, old white guys. <laughs> and Carl says diversity is having the widest possible set of perspectives and experiences available to you as a group. So those are some great answers about diversity. Question two, if we're talking about that, it's going to be what is inclusion, especially in the context of diversity? I assume that's part of why y'all are here because you want to learn more about that. So for you, what's inclusion? Making it easy for as wide a range of people as possible to be part of that group. Thanks, Ian. Great, I feel like we often talk about, uh, 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 Pana says that it's tough, and I feel like we talk a lot about, all right, Let's get all these rainbows of people that are not like us. And it's like, what do you do once they show up? Peter <laughs> says that inclusion is actually seeking and bringing in diversity. Great. Sean says, when all voices are heard and valued on an equal standing, Carl says, inclusion is all people present have a voice and an ability to change the group. These are great answers, y'all. So you're going to see some of my answers coming up. It doesn't invalidate anybody's, but it's part of what I wanted to talk about here. So diversity and inclusion in tech are often presented as the act of building products that include marginalized people based on group membership. And for this, I have a couple of examples of things that I'm sure some of y'all have seen um, and that you've been asked to do. Um, often group memberships are painted with a broad brush the base off of shallow stereotypes of knowledge. And when you follow that path, you end up with things like this. Who's been asked to put like this kind of picture on a website? So it's like, all right, we need to signal to people that we care about diversity and inclusion. I have had to put this kind of picture on websites far too much. It is frustrating. It gets to like a shallow level of like, all right, these people are here. So it kind of addresses the diversity part, but let's get beyond surface fluff. And instead of us giving lip service to diversity, 
let's talk about actionable steps that we can take to build products that foster inclusion. So things I'm going to talk about are going to be diversity in theory versus diversity in practice, and I'll explain that. Um, sharing the ways that I've worked up and achieving my goals, because just because I'm a person that has marginalizations doesn't mean I haven't screwed up. Doesn't mean I haven't been part of projects where I'm like, oh, that makes sense in hindsight. Um, I am going to share things that work for me. And then processes you can change to improve your website experience for your users and tools that you can use to achieve better results for your audiences. It's one thing to talk about, all right, how do we, uh, let's do this thing. But it's very difficult when it comes to, all right, well, how do we execute it? So, so with diversity in theory and diversity in practice, we talked about this. Diversity in theory has fixtures like this. There's also this. Uh, does anybody happen to know what this is? Like a Hillary Clinton campaign slogan to appeal to Kwanzaa? the Jewish population <laughs> or yep. something. It, or it's Kwanzaa, Kwanzaa. Oh. Yep. yeah. It was, oh, okay. uh, <laughs> yep. it was uh, to be, to show inclusiveness. They decided to change their Twitter icon to a Kinara, which is the, it's kind of like the menorah of Kwanzaa. I don't have a menorah but I do celebrate Kwanzaa, which was to the detriment of my mom, but that's a side story. Um, but it, it kind of rubbed people the wrong way. Like it felt like, oh, okay, cool, Hillary, hot sauce in your bag, but can we also maybe do something about incarceration rates? Maybe. So um, these types of things are gestural attempts at being inclusive. Usually they aren't very representative. Um, and they don't necessarily address the real needs that your audiences have, right? Like I appreciate seeing pictures of, you know, people that look like me. I'm gonna pull this down. I have lots of dolls that are black and it's cool. Cause it's like, ah, that's a doll that looks like me. But if I'm looking for a product or service, I'm looking for something that more addresses my lived experience, right? Um, so I think I've talked this a little bit to death. Uh, so. These are diverse approaches that don't really reflect or address people's realities and day-to-day -day needs. Um, there was a talk that I went to here in Dallas and I cannot ever remember what the name of the product was, but it was a very good um, story, case study about how a group tried to do things one way with the product. Um, they had a website that was for people that had diabetes and they had a tool and they wanted people to use it. So on the website, all of the pictures that they happen to have and a lot of the messaging showed a fit white guy, like muscly, like in his Under Armour shirt and everything. But the actual people who needed the tool were overweight, black and Latino folks. And then often they had family members who were coming and seeking information on the behalf of their parents. Because as you get older, um, in the general population and especially in Black and Latino neighborhoods, you have, you know, the children who are the caregivers of the parents. And so along with that, you know, they ended up changing not only the pictures on the website, but the way that they set up the information architecture so that it wasn't just like, here's what you need if you have diabetes. There were entire uh, offerings in the page for if you have a loved one that needs help with uh you know, taking their blood sugar levels or, and I'm blanking out right now on like the different ways to care for a person with diabetes, but I hope you all understand the example there. Um, once the company changed their branding, they saw adoption of the tools improve. It was just a better experience for their users. Um, this one is one of my favorite pet peeves. And this is more general. I think that a lot of people can understand this experience. Have you ever been directed to a website to do something on your phone and you're given a shoddy mobile experience? The thing that I'm thinking about in particular is parking websites. Uh, it used to be that uh, in Dallas, we have, we have a lot of paid parking in downtown Dallas. I don't like to go to downtown Dallas as a result, but they used to have it where you went and you fed the thing and then you had to go and get the ticket out of the machine and then go take it back to your car. But then they would get annoyed because people would be there for a brief amount of time and like exchange tickets with each other. Cause if there's still four hours left, then help somebody out down with capitalism. But um, <laughs> um, 
So they switched it to where you would need to do it from your phone. And unless you download their fancy app, which often is taking up too much space for no reason, the mobile experience on the website that's asking you to sign on with your phone is awful. Often style sheets are just broken. The target spots are too small. So it's just sometimes for me, what I will do when I get into that situation is that I will just completely forego trying to do anything with the website. I'll go to another pace stall. I'll whip out my car and just be like, you know what? I'm going to put the car in the machine. This would be so much easier for me if I could do it with my phone. But it's not actually designed for mobile users unless you download their app. So when you do theoretical diversity, the important part of the story why I'm bringing this up is that you can often lose customers when you're not actually thinking about how they're going to utilize your products, how they're going to utilize your website. And sometimes when they click out, they're going to click out and just never come back. That's a sale or an opportunity to serve someone that you're never going to get again. So with diversity in practice, we're going to take a deeper look at diverse populations and try to more accurately identify the issues that the users in that group may face. So thankfully, when you base your product solutions on accessibility and usability principles, it will help you to serve multiple groups of people. Um, I am going to skip through my speaker's notes on here because we're going to talk about a lot more of this uh, throughout. Let's see. Oops. Okay. So when you are doing, and to me, when we're starting out with accessibility and usability at the beginning, there's small lifts to just make sure that you're going in and coding a div that's supposed to contain information so that it can be interacted with a screen reader or um, making sure that you can skip the navigation. The reason why I look at them as small lists is because I have, and I'm sure other people here have had to do it too, I've had to go in and try to retrofit a website after an organization that brought me in got sued because the site wasn't built in the first place for accessibility. It wasn't built to be user friendly. And so it's kind of like scraping off like layers and layers of paint. I don't know if anybody else watches like uh, the home improvement shows where they'll take a dresser, right? That's been painted over like different colors because different people wanted it. And it's like how much paint thinner and stripper and like, what is it? I don't know what the thing is called, but the scraper, you have to do all of that just to get back down to the bones of it. But if you build your products and sites with good bones, you won't have to deal with as much of that uh, technical debt. That's the that's the uh, technical phrase for paint stripper, I guess, technical debt. You won't have to deal with that on the back end, hopefully, fingers crossed, unless they decide to upgrade Drupal to Drupal 11. Um, but by improving those experiences of people on mobile devices or experiences for people with disabilities, you also actually end up helping people in other marginalized groups that might not necessarily have a disability or might not be using mobile phones. Um, some examples of people that benefit from it are people who are elderly, um, people in rural communities, and people who experience poverty. So we're going to play a little bit of a game. The diversity in theory and practice game. So. This is going to help us to be able to break down our preconceived notions. Um, I have been working on a workshop for this, um, and I would appreciate any feedback that you all have afterward, because I have discovered that it is somewhat awkward to talk about, to ask people to just throw out stereotypes when we're in mixed company and you don't know people very well. I'm aware that I'm like a black woman, like asking a group of people who are mostly white to tell me stereotypical things. Um, so you can give me feedback on this, but one of the things I think that is important about this is that by pl playing games and doing productive thought exercises, we can, human beings tend to learn better when they play games. Um, it helps you to acquire new skills and information better, and you can actually use it with your team to do a mental exploration of what is your product, what are the services, and it just kind of busts through like, well, I think that, uh, I'll give this example real quick. So I work at the city of Dallas and a lot of black people work at the city of Dallas, but depending on which department those people work in, they have different access to different 
uh, means of accessing the website. Some people who live it, who work in the streets and parks departments, the only device that they have is a cell phone. I had two giant screens in my office. So when I was designing, I had to make sure that I always pulled down to the mobile size. My senior developer had different opinions about that, but I'm not gonna talk about that. We're gonna play a game. What you do need to do though, when you do this, is that we have to have rules and boundaries because like I said, this can get very messy. I also like this GIF of this person that couldn't find their yellow card. So. We're gonna make tasteful suggestions. Think primarily of your own lived experiences or somebody that like you know personally. So for me, one example I like to use is I got swimmer's ear one year. I was working as a secretary and did not realize like why people get headsets instead of doing this, but I completely lost hearing in my right ear. And suddenly like I couldn't put in headphones for things like garbled information was coming in garbled and I just couldn't, I couldn't use the internet in a normal way. And that taught me a whole lot more about um, accessibility. So this here, make sure that uh, the information that you're using, you've learned it from a credible and typically academic resource, like not just something that you heard on Facebook, which went down briefly today. So maybe there's less misinformation out in the world. Fingers crossed, knock on wood. Um, let's try to avoid blanket statements like all people of political party X are uneducated thugs and now that can go for whoever's political party at this point. Or absolutisms that imply obligations like people of gender X are supposed to be breadwinners. That's my least favorite one. Um, but those kinds of things are non-productive, they're non-starters, they don't get us to anywhere closer to being able to understand each other or the people that we're trying to serve. So. Uh, we talked about this earlier and refrain from making blanket statements. Okay, I outpaced my slides. So um, with this, I am going to give you a theory group membership or I will give you the practical and then we'll identify like the areas of accessibility and usability principles that it can address. So for this one, I'm going to take the hard one <laughs> and uh, give you some examples. So in theory for people of color, what are some of the ways that this group can be impacted? So typically, a lot of people um, will realize that people of color are heavy users of mobile technology. So that relates to the principle in accessibility of mobile first. Um, Black, white, and Latino users have roughly similar smartphone ownership levels, so about 80%, eight and 10 in all groups. Um, but they are, for people of color, they are more reliant on internet access from their phones. 25% uh, of Hispanics and 23% of Blacks are smartphone only internet users. Um, and they are more likely to rely on their smartphones for a number of activities, such as looking up health information or looking for work. Um, those households are also less likely to have a computer uh, in the home, which blew my mind because I grew up with computers in my home. So um, is that the next one? Yep. So about 58% of black people and 57% of Hispanics report owning desktop and laptop computers. 82% of the white population in the United States does. So that's a pretty significant disparity. And then I think we talked about this. Sorry, my speaker's notes are out of sync with me clicking the tabs. But, uh, and I think this is something that we've learned during the pandemic, that Black and Latino families tend to be much more multi-generational households, which goes into the poor principles of, the, poor principles of accessibility, uh, perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And I can go over those. Um, and then the last one that most people think of uh, black and Latino folks in the people of color groups tend to be those who are disproportionately economically disadvantaged. So that relates to the poor principles and mobile first. So I'm gonna pause. Did anybody have any questions about that breakdown? What are the poor principles? Okay, uh, the poor principles are from the ex from accessibility. Uh, they are perceivable, operable, understandable and robust. And they are from the 
WCAG standards. Let me grab them. Core standards. Thanks, Ian. But they are principles that we can use to improve our websites and make sure that people are able to access 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 them. Uh, perceivable. There we go. They're generally what a lot of the success criteria are based off of. Okay. I'm just seeing a blank white screen right now. Oh yeah, it, I uh, I paused to take questions. I can go back to the not blank screen. <laughs> okay. Did anybody else have any questions? One other thing I think that's important here is like the mobile thing is is mm -hmm. like really interesting in the the speed of access, right? Is different across the different. Uh, groups of people, like people who are on slower networks or older devices is higher in uh, the groups of people of color versus white people, right? Mm -hmm. So like testing on testing on those things versus, you know, just your fancy iPhone in your pocket mm -hmm. or, you know, a squish down web browser is like really important to do too. Yeah. Let's see. So our next item that I will ask y'all to shout things out for or uh, write in the chat. So in practice, we're gonna look at poverty. So group memberships. So we're gonna look at, all right, these people are in poverty. Who are the people that you think would be impacted by that? I'll go ahead and throw this one out. Black, indigenous, and people of color. Um, I'll read off some stats while you are, are thinking about the other answers that are here. Um, Typically, uh, those groups, let's see. So in the United States in 2018, uh, white people are 60% of the population. They have about a 9% poverty rate. Indigenous persons are 1% of the population with a 24% poverty rate. Hispanic people are 18% of the population with a 19% poverty rate, so almost even. And then black people are 12% of the population with a 22% poverty rate. I see Carl says rural communities. I wish I had this where I could do it like a, what is that thing called? Family feud, where I could just pop it up. Maybe there's a platform where I could do that. Show me rural communities. But then I wouldn't want to do the buzzer thing to anybody. There are, I have one, two, three other answers. I would say inner city, right? Would be another potential area where there's more poverty in in like you know New York City, not like the fancy parts. Let's see. I don't have inner city there, which was actually interesting because I thought there would be more people in urban areas. Um, let's see. Urban areas were reported at a 12.9 percent rate of poverty compared to other groups. How about the flip side? How about rural rural areas? Mm -hmm. Rural areas. So rural poverty rates were reported at 16.4% in 2017, which actually went down from 18.4%. And that was the 30 year peak for that. Um, it does have impacts in all areas of life. Um, there's internet access, because I know I pay an ungodly amount for my 1G internet and whether or not you are able to buy it versus even having access to high speed internet in rural communities, right? Uh, Amy June often talks about how she lives out in the country uh, and it's very hard to hard get to consistently fast internet. Um, let's see, international rural poverty is also an issue and I have some links for that if folks are interested. I'm gonna share this one link from the Brookings Institution about poverty in America and the rural areas. Okay. So trans folks are actually a group that show up disproportionately in impoverished areas. Um, trans Americans are four times more likely to live in poverty than anybody in any other group. So if you look at um, the poverty rates for each of the racial groups, you're gonna get about four times as many people uh, represented there homeless people, and we'll dive into this a little bit later, but usually if you don't have a home, you don't have a lot of money. Rural areas, 
and then single parents. So 20% of solo parents who are people that are living alone with a kid live in poverty. Cohabitating parents are only at a 16% rate. And I mean, we're seeing that a bit with the pandemic too, right? Did I skip that? Okay. So slow internet speeds or no internet in the home. So we talked about this a little bit on the last slide. We've got poor folks. Rural areas, and I'm gonna go through them a little bit more quickly because I know I'm consuming a bit of time. Um, Roughly two thirds of rural Americans say that they have a broadband internet connection at home, which is actually up from 35% in 2007. But they are also uh, starting to use mobile technology more. So that's pretty good. More access, uh, I guess that'd be similar to how people of color um, experience having the internet at home. And own, but ownership of desktop or laptop computers has only risen very slightly in rural areas. So even with looking at, all right, if somebody's using a mobile phone versus what their population is in an ur urban or rural setting, you can't even put a blanket brush on that. So for low internet speeds and no internet in the home, I was surprised to learn at a Drupal event that I went to, uh, I think it was GovCon in 2018, Homeless people have cell phones. Like, and I apologize if that sounds like very Pollyanna and like not very like smart, but I didn't realize this. Um, I think it's important to highlight it because there are 95% of the people who are homeless have access to mobile phones, which means that they can, uh, I met a gentleman that created a website that would get resources for homeless people and get them access to being able to apply for things. Um, and he made sure that it was a mobile friendly website. Um, they often will use prepaid phones or, and they might not have credits on the prepaid phones, but if they have access to Wi-Fi, they can access the internet. So that was pretty cool to me. But this is also an example of folks that don't have internet in the home. Does anybody recognize this picture from a recent article? So. These were two little girls that were trying to do their homework during a pandemic because when they were at school, they had internet access. Uh, they could go in, they could try and finish their homework before, and this is not necessarily to these little girls specifically, but they could do their assignments online. And even, they might not have even gotten the assignments online, but once the pandemic hit, mom and dad didn't have internet in the house and uh, they were Latina, I believe. And so, as we talked about earlier, their only mobile, their only access to the internet might have been through a family member's mobile phone. And if you've ever tried to tether and do development at the same time, let alone homework with kids, not working out pretty well. So here's some other important takeaways. And I think that we can, I'll make these slides available to folks. But um, other important takeaways are things like sex considerations, so colorblindness in men, um, gender role considerations, we talked about this a little bit earlier, uh, people who are caretakers or socialized as women and socialized as caretakers. It is important for us to note that there are flaws in our assumptions. Uh, we've seen this happen with the pandemic. Our economy and our systems around us are shifting and a bunch of the things that we thought were just a given are just falling out from under us. So it's important that we are building our sites to be resilient with usability and accessibility principles um, so that that way we can pivot a little bit better. And I hate that I use the word pivot in relation to the pandemic because everybody does that. But um, what that ends up doing is helping us to help people find the same information a bit differently. Um, it's in the methods that they're most used to or that's most useful to them. And your website and your shiny user experience that you put on it might not actually be the final outcome that somebody needs. So for rural people, a majority of the adults in that group say that high speed internet is not actually a problem for them because they can just order paperwork for what it is that they need and then take it to the post office and they're completely happy with that. Um, there is also the Affordable Care website, uh, the ACA website, 
lots of people in the Latino Latinx Latino Latinx community did not want to use healthcare.gov. They are used to going in person and conferring with somebody when they sign up with a, for a service like that. So you have to think about the people that are actually using it. So solving for this gamut of issues, it's a lot of them. Your first step is gonna be building room for your margins in your product from the beginning. I keep harping on it, accessibility and usability principles from the start. Um, when you do that, you are introducing in the core of your products the, a way to make a robust user experience and it makes it so much easier than having to retrofit. Step two, um, consider how your product offsets marginalizing situations for folks and how those offerings can be expanded. We all know that there are features that we have that come out with launch and things that come out with post-launch. Um, work on how you resolve the situations that you've identified or been informed are gonna disproportionately affect the core base of users that you were trying to serve. Um, in this case, we know that for many of our users, they might not have a computer at home. Uh, their phone is the only means of accessing the internet. So make sure that we are testing our new features for mobile readiness. Um, I believe this might have come up later, but I think it's important to talk about now. When I worked for the city of Dallas, I worked for the pension fund, and a lot of the people who spend the longest parts of their career working for the pension fund are in the streets and parks departments. They're uh, people of color who usually have, um, they're in poverty. And I almost went off on a rant about how people are paid as city workers but we would build features and having taken some accessibility courses, I would ask my senior developer, well, hey, do we make sure to test this on mobile first to make sure that people can use it? And he's like, no, it's not important. Just, just squish the screen down, it'll be fine. They can still read it. Um, and we actually had to go and get a Chromecast and hook it up to our conference room TV so we could show them like, hey, dude, Look at how this looks if you're somebody that's on the phone trying to register for this. Uh, because in our communications department, we would actually go out and try to get people registered. Uh, he, he unfortunately did not get the experience of doing that. It was a choice. Um, and so he couldn't see that these men like with giant hands and like bulky work gloves were trying to fill in their forms for being able to register and find out if they could retire or not. And it was just failing all over the place. Um, and step three, just take it step by step. It is a lot. Um, I am actually still going through my certifications for accessibility. I have my Certified Practitioner of Accessibility Core Competencies, which is CPAC. I always have to remember what they stand for. But now I am studying for my WAS, which is the Web Accessibility Specialist exam. And that one has about 60 hours that I need to study. So you, thankfully, the uh, WCAG, the W3, let me link that, I'm sorry. So the W3 has a set of standards uh, for getting your website um, accessibility ready, but they also acknowledge that this is a lot for people to do. So there are three different standard levels. Uh, there's A, AA, and AAA compliance. Most folks are told to, um, aim for trip double A compliance. Um, at level A, you have 25 criteria that you need to meet so that you can reach level A. And then at uh, double A standard, it is 38. So just 13 more criteria. But you know, you and your team are gonna have to have discussions and more than one discussion as to what success means to you and in which context. Um, government, finance, and higher education typically are required to be at the AA standard of compliance in the United States, at least. So, and Peter, how am I on time? Or Sean? Um, I mean, we're flexible because you were the main the main thing and then we're just gonna do kind of more open Q&A. So, okay. uh, you know, you don't have to rush, uh, but um, yeah, I can, sure, take I guess 15 I can... minutes. Do, yeah. you know, certainly do 15 minutes more if you want. Okay, I can also pause to see if people had other questions. Yeah. I just realized I'm dropping like, what keg and this and that, so. 
Yeah, we have had a couple, uh, the group did have a couple other discussions in the past year of accessibility, but yeah, there may be people who don't uh, know those terms. So yeah, if you have questions, uh, especially just what do those things mean in accessibility context, yeah, you should probably be able to unmute yourself or um, yeah, drop them in the chat. Uh, hmm. Seeing Graham, no questions yet, uh, but thanks for the great presentation. So I think, yeah, probably long, yeah, people have questions on basics or we can circle back at the end about it, just a little bit on what these things mean and um, maybe how to how to achieve them in your in your web projects. I, I just had a comment. I've got a friend who teaches at uh, John Jay in New York City and hmm. some of his students have bandwidth issues even though they have access to high-speed internet there's like multiple family members all running Netflix at the same time and so it's <laughs> Even though they theoretically have high, high bandwidth, they actually in, in practice don't, which I found really interesting. Yeah. Is that before or after uh, pandemic happened? This is in the pandemic, during the pandemic. Well, it's probably always been the case, but it, it, they're finding it to be a real issue for them in the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, there's uh, some really cool ways Michael asks, what development tools do we use to test accessibility? There's a section that's in here that my coworker Kat, um, my old coworker Kat contributed. I might move to that one instead of the implementations. It's talking about how do we do all this diversity and accessibility work? Magic. Not really though, we got tools. So, Kat Shaw of Lullabot actually has this really great uh, per, uh, per presentation called How Cool Accessibility Tools Can Make Your Life Easier. And I'm going to link her slides. You can follow along with it. We put just some of the basic ones in here. So there are five different categories of accessibility tools that we'll cover in, like here that she gave. So there are web-based tools. So they are used exclusively online. It's best to bookmark them, Kat says, into your browser so that you can use them as needed. Uh, great companies and organizations like the Pacello Group, DeQ, who is uh, who I do my accessibility training and learning through. Um, Carrie Fisher is a wonderful person, does Ally Talks. And WebAIM, they are always creating new open source tools. So it's important to keep your eyes out for updates that they might do. Um, there are browser tools. Those are add-ons that will come into your browser. Those will check your uh, actual code that is going out, your HTML, your CSS, how it's loading, um, and give you feedback on, is this site actually going to load for somebody that's um, on a 3G internet speed? Because we're up to like 5Gs now. Does it go any higher? I guess so. Um, they, some of the browser tools are plugins, some of them are extensions. Uh, there's one that you can use to test for colorblindness um, and how it will display your website if somebody has like different color uh, blindness issues. Most of the tools have versions of the main browser, so Chrome, Firefox, and Safari. Content management tools, Drupal, WordPress, uh, those actually help a lot with compliance because you have a standardized way that your information is being laid out, right? So you're not having to check every single individual page. You can check your templates. Um, OS tools, a, we'll go over those, and then desktop tools. So OS and desktop are different because an OS tool and I'm going to get this wrong because I'm not a Mac user, but I'm aware of it. So Mac users have some screen reader things that are already built in. Uh, I know that there's a magnifying tool that's on Windows that I'll use sometimes, or I've seen my coworkers use for if the text on the screen is too small and for some reason they aren't letting you resize the text. Um, that still happens now. But for web-based tools, um, there are file compression tools. So this is kind of something like what Ian was saying, right? If you don't have a whole lot of internet, a lot of bandwidth that's coming through the pipes, you want to make sure that you're not putting giant like JPEGs, WebP files on your site that are going to take a whole lot longer to load um, for your users. Uh, JavaScript bookmarklets bookmarklets for accessibility testing. So with this, these are, let's see, 
they're bookmarklets that you can click on. Oh, thanks. Is it Boutros? Mac OS uses the built-in voiceover screen reader. Thank you so much. Um, for the JavaScript bookmarklets, you can just click on it without having to install anything, and it will let you um, identify any kind of accessibility issues that you have. Um, and then with WebAIM, that's a color contrast simulator. Let me see if I can find, let's go to MSNBC. Because I figure that's a relatively germane site. I have an ad blocker and then complain all the time about my ad blocker. Can y'all see my MSNBC tab? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, not anymore. Okay. Let me grab this. Can you see this web aim thing here? Yeah. Okay. So this will tell you whether or not the colors that you're using together make sense and at different um, screen resolutions. So one thing that I've learned, like we all know not to put like, we all generally know not to put yellow text on a white background. Like I, I got that out of my system during the MySpace era. But at different screen resolutions, you can end up with the readability being an issue. Can I do that here? But in case, you know, marketing gives you some colors and they're like, well, hey, can you make this and this go together? Because it looks great. Now you have proof to be like, hey, I understand that you believe that this looks great, but this is what happens when people are trying to use these particular colors on your website. And usually, too, when you tell people about getting sued, they'll stop using bad things on their website. I've learned this. Uh, Carl says, color pickers and Firefox and Chrome also give contrast info now. Oh, wow, cool. I haven't been in, let's see. Because you can change this, right? Carl, how would how would I do that in uh, Chrome? Scroll down on that, I think. On, on that uh, picker box that you're in? Yeah. Scroll, there's a little scroll bar on that. Go down for that. Look at that. Contrast info. <gasps> Oh, I learned what? something today. It says no. <laughs> <laughs> so are these? Wow, it even gives you the double A and triple A levels of compliance, right? Because there's different contrast ratios for double A and different ones for triple A. How did you get there again? <laughs> okay, so when you do uh, the right click to inspect an element, uh -huh. if it's got color to it, you can click on this little box It'll open the color picker and it says shift click to change color format. Get out. You can do that now too. <gasps> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I learned something. That's wow. Cool. <laughs> and then when you scroll down, because who scrolls? Now it'll tell you whether or not your color contrast is correct. And then if you go a step further, wow. Nice. Right. This is a uh, cat's area is uh, tooling. So I'm going to show this to her and see if she knew it. That's going to be exciting. <laughs> but yeah. So cool. Uh, some browser based tools, like we discussed, these are some add ons. Color blinding. Do I have this one installed? Let's do it now. Another, uh, for color blindness. Um... Firefox has it built in now. It'll simulate all of the different uh, types of color blindness as well as just sort of changing contrast. Built into Firefox? Built in. It's right there. I've been sleeping on Firefox. I need to get back in the game. Sounds like. Let's see. Let me open MSNBC. MSNBC. Bring it back over here. All right, I have too many. Oh, well, here's the Axe Dev Tools. I can show you all that. Where is color blinding? I have a plugin that takes W3 schools out of my thing because it gets confusing. Okay, so you can see how the MSNBC site looks to somebody that is red blind, green blind, blue blind. 
So it's just all different ways that somebody might experience your sight that you don't you don't think of. Yep. Yeah, that's, and that's pretty much what the Firefox experience is. Well, I haven't used color blinding before. Yeah. It's nice that I have to download things. Um, and then Axe and the Lighthouse Audit. Let me see. Turn off color blinding. Deactivate. Okay, so the Axe tools are down here. The so Axe Dev tools. Well, actually, don't, why do you ask me this question so much? <laughs> Start using. So you can scan all of the page, part of the page. And so it'll start to analyze your site. So now they are grouping the issues. Um, it'll t so don't get too alarmed when you see that there's 262 issues, because the cool thing is that it will tell you like how critical each one is. You can let it know, hey, I'm just trying to go for AA compliance here. Like we're not at the AAA level yet. Um, so you've got issues that are critical, serious, moderate, and minor. And it'll, uh, I'm, can, yeah, go ahead. You can click on the issues in the um, underneath minor issues there. And I think you mm -hmm. get an opportunity to highlight them and then you can sort of mm -hmm. step through them. Oh, here we go. Here's our highlight button. Where to go? Oh, it's uh, and then there's a, let's reload. Okay. Right, and then where it says one of two up in the upper right of the panel, you can actually oh, yeah. step through and get the highlight to move from one part of the page to another. Thank you, Carl. Uh, of, of fun interest, there's about 60 more when your ads are on. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> That's right, I have an ad blocker. <laughs> my number one accessibility tool, turn off ads. <laughs> Right. That was actually in my uh, accessibility test. They said that ads are detrimental pe to people with an attention deficit disorder. And I was like, that's why I bought so much shit off of Amazon. So this <laughs> makes sense now. Because they just show you an ad. And I'm like, this looks great. And they're like, we know you've seen this five times. If you see it a sixth time, you'll click on it. Yeah. So this is color contrast. This happens sometimes when you use fonts that are too thin. So I really like this tool. Lighthouse, in case anybody hasn't seen it. Well, apparently now it puts a fake phone on here. That's kind of neat. But Lighthouse audits um, and Lighthouse is built into Tugboat now. Right, Kathy? Uh, if you're still yep. there. Yep. Uh, Tugboat is, Kathy, can you explain what Tugboat is? My my brain is fading. I know what it is, but it's been a <laughs> Sure. Minute. Uh, so I, I know about Tugboat because Tugboat is uh, part of Lullabot, and so some of my coworkers uh, work on it, and we also use it uh, for many of our projects. And it, uh, it makes um, previews of websites, so you, it builds your whole stack for you if you have like a pull request. Um, and if you're using it, the machine is like running, and if you're not, it goes to sleep. Uh, and then when you need to test something, you, know, you wake it back up again. So it, it uses like uh, virtualization uh, technologies and Docker and stuff to like kind of instantly spin up sites and, uh, and have them go to sleep when you're not testing anything. So it doesn't cost you money. Um, and it has built into it uh, at uh, some various levels, I wonder, uh, it might be under pricing or something. Um, it has uh, um, it has Lighthouse built built in, so you can look at a PR um, and say, "Oh, my Lighthouse score is this," uh, and without my PR, my Lighthouse score is like this, uh, and you can kind of compare them. We'll cheat and look at the docs. <laughs> You know if that uses like the headless Chrome driver sort of technology? Is that how that runs that or? I do not know. I also do not know. I just know that we used it. <laughs> uh, uh, if anybody, yeah, I'm gonna move for, 
uh, from that. But I was going to say I can ask, and I realize I'm not a lullabot. But maybe <laughs> Kathy can ask. <laughs> I still talk to lullabots all the time. Oh, you know what? So here, just real quick, uh, yeah. Karen, try clicking on support on the left at the bottom there. OK. There's a Slack channel. Oh, well, yeah. Uh, where uh, anybody can join. Um, and so, Carl, I would I would encourage you to uh, join the Slack channel about Tugboat uh, and, and ask. Uh, mm -hmm. Or you could tweet, it, tweet at them, too. Uh, they like the Twitters. <laughs> uh, yeah. Tugboat helps cool. so much. Oh, no, we've lost our spot. It's okay, though. Yeah, I, I had quite a few slides, so. Um, content management tools, Drupal accessibility. Um, the Olivero theme actually has, uh, has accessibility built into its core. It's the new default uh, theme. Uh, it's fully accessible. It was named after Rachel Olivero. I named it, so I get excited about talking about it. Um, but there are some guides here, and I'll share the slides with y'all. And then OS tools. So here's all the ones that Mac has. Uh, voice over screen reader, voice control, hover text. If y'all have not experimented with the screen reader before, I really, really encourage you to do it. Um, also, uh, Rachel Olivero, while she was with us, wrote so many great articles about how people who use screen readers actually use them to experience the internet. Um, it helped me when I was developing the accessibility testing and uh, repairs practice at the company that I worked at at the time. Um, but it's, it's much different trying to navigate a website with no screen on and only having the audio information given to you. Uh, especially forms. So uh, please make sure that you give that a shot. Um, I'll just go through these here. And if anybody has anything that they've used that they think was really cool, uh, please shout that out because apparently we're learning together and I love that. Um, desktop tools, Adobe Acrobat's PDF accessibility checker is very important. And if you work with anybody that's on a marketing team, encourage them to use that because there are a bunch of things that we do to PDFs that make them not accessible. And they can be very easily, they can be solved with not as much effort as it would be to try to go back and fix it. I just try to fill out a form on a PDF for a housing application and they made it so that you can't fill out the PDF unless they authorize you to fill it out. So now I've got to print it out and it's not my favorite thing to do. but. Um, JAW screen reader and NVIDIA are on uh, Windows desktop. I use NVIDIA. Uh, you can actually change it to Japanese. And that was really cool to learn. Um, I'd speak like some Japanese. Uh, so yeah. So in summary, us technologists should be holding ourselves and our dev communities accountable for things like good coding standards. But we should also hold ourselves accountable for implementing inclusion as well. I think so. And also think that it's pretty cool. There's like a lot of fun stuff to explore and learn and you get to understand how other people experience life. Um, I keep talking about the pandemic, but I think one of the things that us all, a lot of us working from home have gotten to do is to see people as full humans and not just the person that comes into the office. It's like, how does this person experience their entire life? Um, uh, accessibility and usability give us ways to do both. So we should definitely be taking advantage of that. Um, it's a set of core competencies that some people spent a long time thinking about working on and pulling them together. And I mean, it's something that works. Why not use a blueprint? So, and then the cool thing is that there's plenty of cool tools to help us accomplish it. Uh, so thank you so much for having me. I'm open to questions if we want to do cool stuff. This is me on Twitter. My last name used to be Glover, so that's why it's Taryn G. Somebody stole Taryn because I used to tweet advertisements from Kim Kardashian, and then my Twitter handle was very expensive, so they picked it up when I changed my name. Oh well.
Ta-da. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Please ask yeah. questions. Please tell me how awkward it was to make y'all yell out stereotypes about things. <laughs> The one thing I was a little curious about still was uh, maybe uh, an example of like a really failed project and like some kind of lessons learned because, oh. you know, it, uh, you know, I guess we're, we're sort of lucky in a way, like, you know, Carl has been bringing our web app leaps forward in accessibility, but, you know, we also are uh, mostly dealing with people who are like researchers and in a lab with computers. So yeah. um, it's not, not quite the same level of, but yeah, I'd be curious to like unsuccessful. <laughs> yeah, I skipped this one. So when I worked for the city of Dallas, working for the pension fund, we had a problem that was not related to accessibility. It was a security issue. So Peter, Kathy, y'all know about these. We had bots that kept trying to log into people's accounts and we had username and password on the same page. And so our solution for it is that we were going to put username and password on different pages. And then there was going to be a third page where we added a randomized security question and they could pick from any three. So the number of bots that tried to log in, like it dropped drastically. And this is a financial institution, right? So they really want that information. But then when I was going through like our, this is a D7 site, like all of a sudden forgot your password jumped up to like the top pages. But it was always in Spanish, like Olvida su contraseña, I think. And I was like, why does everybody keep doing this? So we translated this modal to explain this is why we're changing your password. This is why we're changing this whole situation. But we did not explain any of this process to people in Spanish. So you go to log into your thing. Sorry, you go to, and it would reset your password too, like once you tried to log in. And so this English language dialogue box would come up. And especially if you're on a mobile phone and it's not just doing Google Translate for you right then and there, it's like, well, something happened. I can't log into here. But the Spanish speaking users were like, if I just go to forgot password, I can get in. And they didn't have to set the third question. So anytime they wanted to get in, they would just reset the password and be able to access their accounts. Yep. Mm. What we did to fix that um, is that we actually, we also did not provide security questions in Spanish. So we added Spanish security questions, explained the process. And from then on, I made sure that we put everything in Spanish. I guess this other one that's here, uh, so retirees were losing their pay stubs, which happened a lot, or the mail did not send it to them. Um, we provided a way for them to print them online through the portal, and that was really cool. Um, we made the button very obvious, like it was a bright orange button that said download PDF. So the users were able to get the pay stubs at their own convenience, because they either had to have us send it to them in the mail, which if they didn't get it in the mail, it didn't work, or they had to wait another month to get it. And if they were applying for like alone or something and they needed it that day they either had to have access to a fax machine and somebody would have to fax it to them but it gave those users back their agency one hiccup that we had is that someone who i don't think i have to name anymore changed the button so that instead of saying download pdf it said print pdf and i was a person that was working on the help desk so guess who got all the phone calls that said when i hit the print button it doesn't print what is happening <laughs> but we did manage to get it changed in 24 hours when people got tired of me being stuck on the phone all day. <laughs> yeah, these are, these are nice examples because they're not like, you know, the AIM browser plugin doesn't catch it, mm -hmm. right? Like this is something that's about the people. Yeah. yeah. When I first came to work at the retirement fund, uh, my boss, she has low vision issues and she's, she was in like her mid forties at the time. So, you know, not the quote unquote typical person that you think of that needs to have, you know, a screen reader and they actually got her a giant monitor, but our website for a retirement fund was using like 10 point font. And I was like, 
what are y'all doing? Why would you do this to people? Like, <laughs> yeah. Just little things like that. Hmm. Does anybody else have horror stories that they would like to share? Yes. Cool. That was great. Thanks so much. I think, yeah, we'll, if you don't mind staying we'll, we'll go into questions and answers. People may come back with uh, more questions as we go forward and process. Um, now, Kathy, you said you wanted to get people to like do a survey or something. Maybe yeah. that be a... You want me to set up yeah. a poll? Is that easy? Oh, can you do that? I, I can do that. Yes. All yes, right, yes. Set up a poll. Kathy's poll. Okay. All right. So my poll is which hand do you use to type the B key? And you may need to try this. Like think about typing the word about. Like if you were gonna type the word about, which, which hand do you use to touch the B key? So the answers are left and right, Chris, uh, Sean. <laughs> the, answer, the answers are- Are, are we um, anonymous? Do you wanna be anonymous? Sure. All right. <laughs> All right, we're launching the poll. Okay, so you might have to try it. Don't guess. Like, try oh and type gosh. a word somewhere, you know, that has a B in it and figure out which hand you use. I feel like sometimes it depends. Well, just about which one. Uh, depends wasn't on the list, so pick one. <laughs> Next time, we'll, we'll make a depends option on the poll. Oh, my gosh. I, I can't answer it because I started the poll. <laughs> <laughs> so i'll just tell you my answer when it's done all right we got 10 to 12 one of them's me so we're only missing one person kathy did you answer i did okay all right uh, 11 to 12 so the only one who didn't answer is me so it's a 50 50 split because i do laugh what really 50 50 split it's six and six because I, I can't I think answer <laughs> i think technically you're supposed to use your left hand Wow, this is so fascinating. Thank you, everybody, for participating in my poll. <laughs> Wait, why, though? Yeah, why? <laughs> OK, so my <clears throat> my uh, keyboard on my Mac, the T key broke. Uh oh. It, and uh, I, uh, I have a spare keyboard in the apartment, so I plug it in. Um, but it's not a Mac keyboard. So I ordered myself uh, a, a Mac keyboard external keyboard and I ordered the one an ergonomics person recommended to me which is a split keyboard and when I told somebody that I'd done this they were like oh, no 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 you need to know which hand you use to touch the b key <laughs> because they put the b key on one side of the split keyboard oh. uh, but some of some split keyboards have a b key on both sides so uh for <laughs> real yeah. All right. So I, I, I was, I, I thought it was fascinating. I didn't even realize that different people used a different hand to type the B key at all. And I wanted to know, like, you know, was it like ten percent of people? But it turns out, from our very scientific poll, it's fifty. Maybe, maybe, maybe we should also do a poll of how many people have actually correctly learned touch typing versus mashing the keyboard with whatever fingers you're closest. <laughs> no. Now, I don't want to keep it simple. Okay. I just want to know which hand left or right. Are you going to buy the keyboard based on our answers? <laughs> oh, I already bought the keyboard. I have no uh, idea which side the B key is on. No. <laughs> OK, so so I just pulled up an ergonomic keyboard in a picture here. I'm going to show this. Okay, so B is on the left. Where's my zoom go? But here's the, here's the next tricky one. Wait, we can't uh, see your screen. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, all right, we're, this one, I no endorsement. It's not endorsed. Oh, it's, it's multicolored. Oh, it's so pretty. The B key's on the left. The six key's there, though. And I feel like, for whatever reason, my brain doesn't want to touch the six key with my left finger. <laughs> 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 hmm. Like, it's just, it's nearly, it's actually more left than the B key on my back computer, but. My brain wants to use my right hand. 
So yeah. So just for fun. Mm. I'm that's an expensive keyboard. <laughs> right. I found an article that says I am looking for a split keyboard that puts the letter B on the right hand. So now you all know wow. if you ever want to buy we never a split keyboard, we face. yeah. <laughs> wow. Which almost none of you will ever buy. <laughs> but if you do, <clears throat> B key. Build, build your own. Six key. Hmm. Oh, build your own, right? Because then you can move them. Or if you get one that has them uh, both, right? So if oh, they yeah. put the, the ones on both sides, then, it, then you're mm -hmm. more flexibility. That's my poll. Mm. You know, if you had a separate tablet for each key, you could have the <laughs> ultimate inflexibility. You wouldn't have to worry about these questions. Just kind what? of arrange them yourself. Well, you know how the, the screen he showed, it had two keyboards that had, you know, half on one. But right, if you had like 26 that were connected by <laughs> wires, then you could just <laughs> position them wherever you want them. It'd be easy. <laughs> Just like each key has its own yeah. little wire. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> what could go wrong? Yeah. <laughs> Not a thing. <laughs> mm. uh, so we had a question here from Pana about the Drupal forms and sending email of the submission, right, Pana? That's what your question's at? Yeah, maybe if you could elaborate the question a little bit. Mm, sure. So um, I, um, if I download uh, Drupal and install Drupal, and then I uh, have a form on Drupal, which uh, takes the input from the users, how do I, how do I, uh, what do I have to set up so that the emails are sent out? By uh, uh, what taking... kind? What kind of? <laughs> no, no, not email to the user, but email to the owner of the site. Oh, email to the owner of the site. That, hmm. What type of form is hmm. the big question, right? Because if it's a contact form, that's baked into core. But if it's like a node add form, then you need a, like a module or something to do it. Or but a web it, form that's baked in. If it's a web form or a module or a contact form, um, don't... Okay. Wouldn't and all of these uh, require SMTP to be set up? Or... Oh, sure. oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. So the site has to be, yeah. By default, you need a SMTP executable, basically, right? That PHP can talk to. So is that? Are you saying is that the problem level, or or? But there's also like Drupal out of the box, other than maybe the contact form is not going to send you any emails. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So the task uh, uh, I'm running into is um, Ian's uh, the Caribou site, uh, uh, Caribou tribe uh -huh. site that Ian had posted. Yeah. We have a contact us page on there, which is in okay. uh, WordPress. Which is a uh, since it's a uh, PHP, I was thinking it's a sim similar concept as Drupal because we have a <laughs> PHP. Well, yeah, I know, it I know. is it's similar concept. Similar concept. <laughs> <laughs> I know, Sean. <laughs> it's not the similar, but PHP is PHP, right? So mm -hmm. the point, the 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 the, the, uh, the situation that we are running into or seeing is when someone fills out that form, it goes mm -hmm. into nowhere land. Where does it go? How does it get sent to uh, the person uh, to the owner of the site? Oh uh, yeah. So what? Uh, yeah. if I did. If I do this, uh, I, I have done uh, uh, forms, uh, uh, web forms in uh, different languages. And what we had to mm -hmm. do was we always had to have SMTP enabled uh, at the company and they would uh, have a normal SMTP running on a server. And all we had to do was make sure that our config file have uh, SMTP port enabled and the uh, server names, I mean the uh, uh, email server listing of where, how, which, how do you want this form to be sent? Then somewhere in the config file we'll have saying that, okay, if this form is filled out and uh, send, uh, uh, send, is, uh, uh, send button is hit, it goes and takes all the uh, item, all the values from the form and uh, uh, use a uh, send uh, email form or a module or something 
and send it out. So how does how does one do that in Drupal? That's where because I want to imp uh, I want to incorporate it in uh, WordPress. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean at, at at a very yeah I mean at this at one level they're they're doing the same thing. It I would say it's probably it's probably really around the plugin solution, and then having that the SMTP service available on. WordPress side, depending on what your your hosting infrastructure is. So like uh, I use Pantheon a lot for hosting and Pantheon makes sending emails with their websites very difficult, uh, more difficult than it should be, uh, where you have to spin up a, you know, you have to spin up some SMTP service and send emails through that, right? Like you can't send email or not reliably send email in a Pantheon hosted environment without doing that. Um, and then other things like platform SH just spin up a, a free send grid instance for you. So you don't actually see that happen, um, but they do that behind the scenes. So you don't have to think about it. So, yeah, I mean, you need to set up oh. something. Um, I so, mean, I, I generally send up send grid for free so that I can write, you know, fire my mail email through that thing and then just supply the credentials in a plugin or a module or something in Drupal or WordPress. And then yeah. the regular PHP mail function basically uses that thing to send the email out. Ipana, do you, do you know, I mean, have you looked at the code or do you know what it, if it's supposed to be sending email? I mean, maybe it's just collecting messages inside the website or is it just not going anywhere that you can find? Well, it's not going anywhere. Or we are, when, it's, when you say, uh, uh, Peter, collecting uh, on the website, uh, uh, do you mean like, uh, is it uh, putting it in as a uh, articles post or something? Yeah, I mean, it could be saving it in the database as a list of contact messages that you could refine somewhere. I mean, actually, I would hope it's doing that because maybe you missed a lot of them. Um, <laughs> so, Probably. you know, but I like, I feel like with, you know, with the Drupal solutions, I mean, you could, you might well have the option to do that, or you might well have the option to, you know, have it sent by email, but I would think you'd usually want to retain it also on the, mm -hmm. on the site as a kind of, you know, database record of some sort um, in case it didn't actually get sent, right? When you uh, in Drupal, okay, if I go from a Drupal concept, uh, the forms uh, and information, right, and in any of the uh, core or the modules, wouldn't that uh, have an option of uh, saying uh, save it into the database and then also send it out, or is that like a built-in already as a package? It depends. I don't even know. With the contact form, does it save it in the database? Uh, also, not I don't know if Core does it by default. It didn't at one point, but I think they might have brought it in. Hmm. Um, but yeah, so like with web form, which does a lot more complicated things, right? You can um, you can have the option like of probably doing either like saving the form submission or just mailing it or or both, I would guess. I haven't looked at web form in a while. Um, so, I mean, yeah, the risk if you just try to mail it out, right, is if your SMTP connection doesn't work or something, you've lost that message forever. Okay, so uh, Pantheon, uh, 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 Sean, you mentioned Pantheon has a SMTP uh, uh, built in, baked into the uh, hosting mm -hmm. itself? No, they tell you to use a third party service. Oh. Yeah, yeah I put, a, I put a link in the chat. Are you, right, I saw that, so the yeah. send grid, okay. All right, so I need to find something like SendGrid or something. Yeah, we, SendGrid's free. It's easy to set up too. Okay, we are using, uh, would the SendGrid also work with uh, WordPress? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, sh oh, that is best. Uh, Sean, thank you for <laughs> giving yeah. the link. It looks like that, that form plugin you're using has like a whole bunch of buried settings that make this hopefully possible without too much trouble. But the, when you, the, when, I'm sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, go ahead. So with the form setting uh, buried uh, underneath it, uh, uh, I need to uh, dig it into the uh, back end of uh, the code mm -hmm. and actually go and look. There's nothing like uh, in the uh, WordPress uh, dashboard that can automatically magically do all these things? So the one you're using is a plugin, right? It's not the core contact form thing that like ships with like Jetpack or something like that. So like they, again, like, you know, depending on the ecosystem, WordPress is, uh, has more options, I would say, than Drupal does in terms of solving this problem. And so they all kind of work in their own little quirky ways. 
Um, and so some of them have things baked in and obvious and other things have things buried under giant setting stages apparently. So, um, you know, it's again, you know, dependent on the, dependent on the plugin or module you use, we'll have different, you know, uh, ways of, of dealing with this. And again, you know, at the end, at the end of the day, you could set this thing up perfectly. And if your hosting service doesn't support sending mail through the basic mail function, it's, you know, you're, um, you know, you're gonna have to do something where you set up the SMTP module or something or plugin. Okay. okay. Um, so the, the reason I th thought uh, that the host, uh, hosting services is uh, allowing the e emails to be sent out is uh, in the WordPress uh, login uh, uh, WP admin uh, screen, they mm -hmm. have a forgot your password and that actually does send emails out, which is yeah. telling me that it's already set up somewhere. Yeah, like, what host, do you know what hosting provider you're on? Hostinger. Yeah, I mean, but most of them probably have it turned on. Like most most other hosts will have this turned on. Pantheon doesn't have it turned on for like a specific reason. I think Acquia doesn't have it turned on for a specific well, reason too or something. Yeah, they don't want you so, spamming. Yeah, they don't want you like them. spamming things. Yeah, so with Pantheon, my understanding is like they have an email thing that's mm -hmm. turned on but they don't promise that it will work and right. <laughs> so you get a situation where like you said um uh Pana, that like the contact the the forgot password email will go out so then somebody might be feeling good about their website and that email from a contact form will get sent out but on pantheon it's very intermittent Mm -hmm. So even if a forgotten password link works sometimes on Pantheon, I wouldn't want to rely on it if it was collecting information that I needed to get reliably. Yeah. Um, so it might so be. So it's like, like it, yeah, it could, it could, like with Pantheon, they have it and it might work, but they tell you don't rely on it. Yeah. So I, I would, yeah, I would actually suspect if the forgot password works, but this doesn't, that's probably settings in that plugin, maybe need yeah. to be configured. Like they might be configured for like the core mm -hmm. forgot password mm -hmm. in one settings file and they need to be like duplicated into some settings for this plugin to make it work. So it might be that you don't have to do a lot, but you have to figure out where, where the core WordPress email configuration is saved mm -hmm. And then where your plugin contact us configuration is saved and make sure that they match. That would be kind of my starting point. Oh, okay. That does make sense because uh, uh, I was going with the, uh, now I was uh, also looking at the uh, thinking of the concept of Apache. Apache server has it uh, in the, in the HTT, HT access file, right? If it's already set in there, shouldn't it just pick it up but you uh, peter that was a good, that is a good point i will uh, definitely look at that thank you guys i really appreciate yeah. it yep. and girls sorry guys and girls <laughs> <laughs> peter do you want to do you want to um, ask about your block visibility question well, i got some then, answers you know if anybody has some staff want to share too questions or things they want to share admin you did i said if anybody else does yeah can add them in um the block visibility one is really boring. Maybe I'll just ask a short question, which is, has anyone done a SOAP API integration using PHP, but where they extended or overrode the SOAP client to use something modern like Guzzle? Cricket. Not no. recently, not recently, but a while back. Now, again, this is outside of a Drupal environment. I'm just using a PHP and SOAP. Uh, um, yeah from my um, uh, experience with the uh, digital uh, agency. I did do that uh, with the client, but this was a while back, uh, about like six years back. So it might be yeah. different versions. I mean, I think it's doable. It's just the, 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 the actual HTTP client built into the SOAP library built into PHP is really terrible. And so, but there's some risk we're gonna have to integrate with the SOAP API and I just wanna know what my options are <laughs> for, mm. for being able to use like modern, you know, TLS. Mm. So, okay. um, yeah, but maybe, you know, it has more, uh, yeah, more uh, broad, broad interest questions, maybe, or back to accessibility questions. Uh, um, and uh, if not, then we can, 
I'll bring up what, what NGINX unit was, which was something fun in that meetup Carl told me about today. I have a question. Has anybody used uh, any of the Amazon uh, AI services with Drupal? I've got a, a pet project that I'm thinking of doing where I would submit some scans of some old English documents like from say the 1700s and run them through an AI engine and uh, try and generate a, a modern English version. Hmm. But I'm wondering if, um, if anybody's aware of any anything in the Drupal ecosystem that that does anything like that, that interfaces with an AWS service. I mean, you probably need more. Do you have a bunch of like training content for it? Yeah, I mean, I've got thousands of these PDFs, and my brother would, you know, train the engine by reviewing, you know, the initial, say, the first, I don't know, couple of hundred scans. And, uh, well, but you probably need, yeah, you probably need like a couple hundred already translated as a starting point, unless unless they already offer like a, a service. Well, I was, or... think, I was thinking we would submit, say, the first 500 pages, and he would re manually review the, the results and train the engine that way. Hmm. Well, you, I mean, you have to have something to train it on, right? Like you need the outcome to train it on, probably going in. So, hmm. I mean, otherwise... I mean, you know, because or you need something like Google Translate and take a first pass at it. Um, so unless it already has a kind of a language translation thing, it already has something sort of close to what you want. I, I don't know how that would work. Or unless you're just mm -hmm. getting words, are you just trying to get like OCR, basically translate the script into letters? Well, I guess, yeah, the first pass would probably be almost OCR. And then he would co correct anything that, you know, that it barfed on. Yeah. And train it that way. Yeah. Okay. Let me think about it some more. Hmm. <laughs> I have a question if I can go. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Good to see you guys. Um, I had an interview question that I would kind of like your guys' opinion on, on how I should have answered it or what the appropriate answer for it would be. It was a systems design question. And the information I was given was I have, like on the homepage, we're dealing with a bunch of bookings. So you would have whatever the booking was on the homepage, for example, like a wedding. And then underneath you would have the list of events that go with the bookings, like the ceremony, the reception, and you could click on one of them. So if you clicked on the ceremony, it would bring you to another page. And then that would show you all the items that belong to that event. So like if you need chairs, tables, et cetera. So that was what it looked like. And my question was, that the system was getting an overwhelming number of bookings and then everything crashed. What is the first thing I would look for? And like, how would I go about kind of resolving the issue? And I'm just like curious to what your guys like response to that would be. Wow, can you say the question again? <laughs> yeah. Like not, not the whole setup, but is, yeah. Not, not yeah. the setup, but just the question. So dealing with the bookings, they're getting like an overwhelming number of bookings and like so many that it, the whole website crashed. What's the first thing that I would look at to try to resolve the issue? Hmm. I mean, I would probably- and I guess like even from like an entry level, like what would you expect, you know, entry level junior to like say to you? Right, like what would be size. some sample answers, right? Yeah. Right, yeah. I mean, I would first want to see what the bookings look like and if they're real. So I would suspect that you're getting, for some reason, kind of automated signups that aren't real customers. Um, and that, you know, Karen kind of mentioned, you know, where they had people trying to, you know, hack password forms, right? They had to adjust the structure of the form or like add an extra question to the form to um, suppress bogus signups. So like, I would want to look at that data and like, you might see, I mean, if you ever had a website that got like massive comments spam, you just see it's a ton of garbage or they're posting links to some kind of, you know, videos where they're trying to get people to click through and make it, you know, five cents off it or something. Mm -hmm. um, so if your bookings look like that, right, then, you know, you've got like a spammer problem. Um, so that would be kind of what I want to know before, before anything else. Um, okay. um 
I would I would throttle your ability to submit forms, right? So like that might be another way of doing it. Uh, would be what does um, that mean to throttle? like slowing down the ability to submit them? So like you could like create like a queue where only ten people could be submitting the form at once, right? And the next person's okay. in line, right? Like you could do something bizarre like that. Shoprite does that when you tried to do mobile ordering when the pandemic hit. Like and they got flooded. There was this like little guy in a cart. It was like, you know, you're like 1200th in line for, for digital shopping. It's like it absolutely drive you bonkers, but it didn't crash their website, right? Um, you know, so there's, there's other ways of, you know, uh, you know, slowing things down so that your website doesn't come to a, a you know, halt. Right. Uh, you know, the other thing is you throw more resources at it, right? So if right. you're getting a thousand requests and they're valid requests, you know, then you need you know, to increase your capacity to handle that, right? Whether you need more PHP workers or whatever that might mean in terms of your, your scalability of your site. Yeah. I mean, if that was the problem, I, I think my first question might be like, how much of this data and structure are you generating when they first submit the event request? Mm -hmm. Like, let's say, like a lot of people just like, oh, this looks like an interesting service. Maybe I'll click through and create the, uh, the wedding event. Right, and let's say your system is on, the, when they do that, it like automatically generates like the 50 um, timeline things that go along with it. I, I forget mm -hmm. what exactly the setup was, right? But you know, so imagine this is actually from one form submission, now you have to generate 50 more things in the database mm -hmm. um, for each one of those people. And so you might instead, you know, this is a little similar to what Sean said, but you know, there might be a couple of things. Like first off, maybe, um, you know, don't do any of that. Be like, wait till a second step where they kind of validate if they're really interested in it, or um, you could queue them up, you know, to generate all those things late at night so they can see them when they come back the next day and you can send them an email saying it was ready. Um, so, you know, if it was legitimate traffic, there, there's things like that where you could kind of look at like what you're doing that requires a lot of processing, a lot of database activity at that initial sign up step and try to defer, essentially defer that work especially defer it to a time when your server is not getting a line of sign up simultaneously. Okay. Yeah. The other thing I would want to look at is like when the server breaks, like I would want to know how, like what, what are the errors on the server? Is it like out of memory or is the, uh, is the like CPU usage maxed out? And like, I might use some tools to help me look at what's happening on the servers. There's like some tools that can do that. Mm -hmm. So I wanna know like, what was like, what was the error? Like, was it a timeout or was it my SQL gone away? Um, and then I would, you know, maybe wanna use a tool to like maybe investigate like what the server resources usage are in kind of a normal environment versus like one of the times right before it crashed, that might be some useful information. Yeah, I think the question of what, what does the crash entail, right? So crash might be the next person who comes to the website doesn't get a response, right? Um, you know, the crash might be the database server literally crashed because it ran out of memory. The crash might be the web server crashed because it ran out of memory. Uh, crash might be PHP crash because it ran out of memory. As Kathy was saying, like, or, you know, or it, or it seems to work, but it's just so slow that people give up, right? Those are all, I would say like, people might call all of those situations a crash, but they're really mm -hmm. different. Um, you know, it might be there's enough resources, but someone just configured uh, the web server so it would only take five requests at a time simultaneously. And mm -hmm. so you got 20 people trying to make web requests, but it's only configured to handle five. And so it's literally just a configuration problem um, yeah. and not actually a crash. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the right, server so, might be big enough. Yeah. Yeah. So I think all, all of those things, you know, are kind of possible things you'd look at this at, you know, I, I would first want to eliminate spam because there's like, there's a whole you know, book full mm -hmm. of techniques to like thwart spammers that, you know, have nothing to do with performance. So if you thwart the spammers and you, you know, cut down 90% of your traffic because they weren't valid to start with, then you're, you know, you're probably going to solve the crashing. Got it. What do people think about like kind of what Samantha was saying, like what kind of level an answer might indicate to you? So like if I gave an answer that was talking about 
you know, like I want to know more about the error message and the servers, right? Like, would you think that's like a beginner thing or an intermediate thing? And if like Peter gave an answer that was like, well, I want to know what the data of the form submissions is like and whether or not it's spam. Like, what do people think about, like we gave a bunch of errors. How would you like classify those? So Kathy, uh, I'll take that one. Uh, the answer that you gave, uh, 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 quickly triggered uh, that you are more of a DevOps, uh, senior DevOps person, because you're looking at the server aspect of it. And uh, yeah. Peter's answer uh, uh, made me uh, think of a person who is a, a senior uh, architect person who is looking at the all aspects of it, like what is it that's causing all those issues and problems yeah. rather than um, just one specific area. Yeah, I think another thing to think about also would be if there's like a time of day correlation or day of the week. You know, again, like, you know, so what yeah, you, you need to know what's happening, happen? right? But, you know, you need to know what's happening, but it might be, oh, like our site is really popular on Saturday morning when everyone's you know, home. Mm. And so we need you know, to have vary the resources available, server resources mm -hmm. available so that, you know, things don't yeah. crash on Saturday morning, right? And that could again be the answer. Um, yeah, we're going to run a contest that will pay for your wedding, uh, but only the first 100 people who fill out the form will be entered to win. Crash your website. But you could probably see that coming, like weeks away, right? You know what I mean? Like, so. When you say like you need more server resources, what does that mean? Um, so, I mean, it's. You know, there's basically CPU power and RAM, I would say, are the two biggest kind of variables there. Um, so um, some some things like PHP basically can't work at all if they don't have enough RAM, right? It will, you know, it'll give you an out of memory error and just crash. Um, things like a database server, uh, are kind of more variable in what, what they need, whether it's CPU or, I mean, I mean, a PHP will be slow, right? If it's, if the CPU is slow, but it might still work. And some like the database server might be configured so it can, it can work with low amounts of RAM, um, but it might be dramatically slower. Um, so it's like, it won't crash in the sense of not working at all or of actually, you know, the process crashing but it might not be responsive because it doesn't have enough, let's say, memory. So it can't load you know, the things it needs in memory. Uh, instead, it's like writing them out to disk and trying to like basically sort through them by hand. Um, so yeah, typically it's like those those two variables. And typic, you know, um, it, it really depends on the application, like the specifics of the application, which you need more of, I would say. Probably these days, I, I almost feel like RAM, I mean, they're both like so readily available now in a sense compared to what they used to be. It's it's kind of ridiculous. Like, and often it's misconfiguration, right? Like, I think the default MySQL settings are still, I mean, they're like for a Commodore 64. I mean, it's really, they're like, they have such ridiculously tiny amounts of memory compared to what's on a standard server that you could readily have misconfigured something like that. And again, that's why it's so like the traffic might not be the level that would actually be a problem, but it's the server is not performing because it's misconfigured, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that's like a kind of crash that's not as obvious to find, um, but it's worth it's worth keeping in the back of your mind, right? Like, um, and that's you know that's where like if you if you said you know help us solve this problem, you might say, well, did you do any load testing? Do you have any expectation of how much, how many of these requests you can handle, right? Because if, if they've never tested it, except having one developer in the closet, you know, clicking submit mm -hmm. and seeing it work, I mean, that might be all it can handle. So you really want, you know, you want to do load testing, say, you know, does it still work if five people do that simultaneously and automate that process at least a few times and just make sure it's, you know, not going to completely fail. Right. Like, what were your expectations? What did you think you were going to be able to handle? That's a good question. And Samantha, can you say the question again? Um, so you, you understand like the gist of what it was, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, so it was pretty vague. It was just, you have an overwhelming number of bookings. And because of that, your system crashes. Where is the first place you're gonna look? Okay, so the question is, where is the first place you're gonna look? And I guess if I were asking that question as an interviewer, I would be looking for a response which asked me questions back before giving me an answer. Hmm. So if yeah. I was interviewing somebody and I, would, and I said, where was the first thing you would look? And somebody said, I would look at the server resources. Like I might be actually not looking for a particular answer, but I might be more interested in what type of questions the person I was interviewing would, would ask me to try and better understand something about the problem. So, so I'm not, I'm not, you know, I can't anyway. So I think it's possible that the person who asked this question wasn't actually interested in the answer, but okay. could have been interested in the types of questions that you might ask in order for you to eventually get to giving an answer, you know, three minutes right. down the line. Like how would you troubleshoot? Yeah, like like Pana put a question in the yeah. chat of like, you know, probably the first thing yeah it asks is like, do you know how many requests were coming in when it crash when it crashes? Because you know if it's a I mean, thousand requests per second is very different from three requests per second, you know, in terms of just sort of your starting point, right? Um, and yeah, you know, yeah, you might want to. Up and see what was the last successful uh, application submitted. Mm -hmm. If you see, if you have a log of the successful applications and when does it stop logging successfully? Mm -hmm. Got it. That was helpful. Thank you. Do you? Because I know these are more like broad questions, but off the top of your head, do you have any like resources you think I should like be looking at to get better at more general system design questions? Because I find them a little. I'm definitely weaker in those. And I think it's just the yeah. lack of not being, being in like an environment where I've like a working environment. So I haven't had to like yeah. use these outside of just like a school project. Well, um, this is where we should join Caribou Tribe because we work on real world sites and we'll let you debug them. Yeah, I mean, yeah. do you think of this, are you, was this sort of like a DevOps role or a web developer role? It was just like yeah, a that's general what software engineer. Um, yeah, cool. software and so could be DevOps. I mean, I had, I have a little book that's called like DevOps troubleshooting, um, which maybe is a good thing because it was sort of small <laughs> as a book, <laughs> but it really goes through a lot of this like troubleshooting. Hey, the server crashed. Where do I start asking the questions? So that's yeah, because that's like what Kathy was saying like is DevOps troubleshooting, like to I mean, ask the questions, and I would be kind of be like timid, like what are those questions, you know? Right. But I think, yeah, I mean, I haven't, it's been a year or two since I've, I read through this, but, you know, it, was, it just gave you some approaches. And actually, yeah, um, uh, Diora was asking last time about, yeah, how to ask good questions, right? So I think, that, you know, there's actually resources on, like, how do you, right, it's more about the problem solving than about giving the answer, right? So I think, yeah, that's yeah, that what they want to Yeah, that definitely makes sense, yeah. Right, they want to see if you can kind of subdivide it, like you can eliminate some possibilities or hone in on what the problem might be, you know, because sometimes, yeah, these things can take days, weeks to solve, right? It's not necessarily obvious, but you have to have kind of like a way to, to narrow down the problem um, so that you can actually find it and make it tractable. Um, so. And, and one thing you, that's really good is you want to see if you can make it repeatable because oh, if yeah. you can't, you can't make it happen consistently. It's really hard to debug it. Yeah, that's that's the best. Like, uh, yeah, I had one of those today. And it was like someone was like, "Well, the production site, this sorting doesn't work on the development version, which is supposed to be a copy of the code and a copy of the database of production. It does work, right?" And you're like, "Well, okay, if it's the same database and the same code and the same everything, why why are they different?" Mm. Um, versions of the uh, app OS and versions of the uh, uh, versions of the uh, HTTP server. No, it was it was it was it was simpler than that. But oh. th the answer is when when 
when Carl's little script creates the uh, <laughs> backup, um, it uh, removes all the cache data. So the <laughs> so the development site had the cache data rebuilt, and the production site didn't have the cache data rebuilt. And this was a custom bit of caching someone had written, and there was no way in the user interface <laughs> to clear that cache. <laughs> um, so How you had to it... like. Hmm? Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, please. So you know, I like had to go and like on the command line and run, invoke a PHP thing to rebuild that particular cache, um, and it got rebuilt automatically in the development one because the cache was empty and it knew how to rebuild it. So how long did it take you to figure out that uh, the production had missing uh, rebuilding the cache or cleaning up the cache? Um, that's that's it, like a needle in a haystack, right? It didn't take me that long, but only because I sort of remembered that my colleague had mm. built this funny caching thing for the particular thing that was broken. Mm. So I think if if I hadn't remembered that, I it would have taken a long time. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a needle in a haystack kind of a problem. Right. Put some numbers on that, Peter. Define a long time. Do you, is that two days? Two hours. Um, I think it would have it would have, yeah, it might have taken an hour or two before, maybe less if I'd just been like gone to brute force and like emptied caches. But, um, and, but, you know, it was nice to have a like a clear, like, I think just this one very specific thing will solve the problem, you know, and then kind of verify that it didn't cause any harm on the development side and then verify that it fixed the production side. So that, um, but, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's other things that you know are like seem super simple that take me hours and hours and hours. Um, yeah. So you know, I uh, I'll be happy to tell you my development frustrations if you want to hear them. <laughs> <laughs> so Samantha, yeah, um, yeah. Ian had an idea for like how you could get experience, which is to like you know join a like a group of people who are you know collaborating together in a learning experiment but trying to build a real thing right yeah um and i think that's a great idea and you know like we've got people in this group that are doing that but you may also have people in like uh you know a community another community that you're a part of in addition to this one so you might have like maybe a, a school in your neighborhood uh for like uh, you know somebody whose like kid goes to school or uh, like a faith group or uh, an activist group that you you know you feel strongly about the cause like you might be able to reach out to them and be like hey I can do things with computers you know do you have a problem maybe I can solve it for you um, that like some of those types of groups are also open to like you know, letting people kind of get experience on problems. And then I would also recommend, uh, you know, getting involved in an open source project is also an option, but that would be more like intellectual and less practical, like actually building a thing. But I think like, you know, uh, so, so maybe, you know, think about if you, if you have an interest in something, you might be able to, I don't know, offer your services and, you know, run into lots of real problems very quickly. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. I'll jump in on that. That's exactly why I set up our little group. There, there's no shortage of unpaid work. You can find any amount of, of people who have projects that need need people to work on them. So as Kathy says, if you've got a particular uh, issue that you're passionate about, reach out to that organization. They almost certainly need their website up updated. Um, yeah. And if you, if you find a site like that and you're looking for help, then you know meetups like this one are great places. Um, my group is, is, as I say, if you wanted to bring your pet project to us, we would help you work on it. Um, I would- What is it called? It's called Caribou Tribe. It's in the chat. Um, oh. um, I would kind of say, though, that, you know, finding an organization, finding a pet project and going off and working on your own, you will eventually get there. You'll get to the place where you want to be. But it, it, 
kind of a, a more painful road than it has to be. There's lots of helpful people out there. The trick is to be brave enough to, you know, admit that you don't know the answers, which you're doing right now. So that's a great first step. Yeah. I um I have like a study group that I'm with uh, that I like mm -hmm. work with with other people from my boot camp and we work on the side projects together, which is good because then I get the practice. But then when it comes mm -hmm. time for questions like these, all of us don't know the answers. So it's like we need that help of someone more senior who has had the experience. Yeah. But mm -hmm. that's why like I wanted to definitely like bring it to the group here because I knew you guys would have some good insight. Um, which you did. And I thank you for that. Cool. But yeah. Samantha, I got a question for you. Yeah. In your, in your boot camp, when you folks are uh, developing your side projects and all that, do you mm -hmm. guys uh, uh, have a uh, best practice uh, uh, approach to uh, write the codes and all that? I mean, the only best practice that's like talked about is keeping your code dry. <laughs> like mm -hmm. aside from that, nothing really like no hard coded. Uh, in us to make it a best practice, which is also why I'm like kind of ready to tackle more real world things. So I can develop like the good habits, I guess. Okay. The reason I asked that is because uh, the question that you asked could be uh, uh, trying to understand, do you have a best practice on uh, how to write a code and uh, where are you uh, looking at uh, doing it? Uh, the answers uh, that were given is also very good answers. Mm -hmm. So if you go with the uh, basic thing and by asking, so do you guys uh, have a best practice in your code? And that would uh, tell the person a lot saying, okay, she knows uh, what she's talking about. Yeah. Okay. What is it said? What like if you had it? Right. If the response was, you know, what kind of load testing was done before this product launch and they mm -hmm. might well say none, <laughs> but yeah, they said, <laughs> oh, we did extensive load testing, but now, but now it crashes when we have load that we expected. You think, okay, well, that's a really something different than if they said, no, we didn't do any load testing. Um, you know, it's just this traffic surprised us, right? Mm -hmm. um, if they ask you what is load testing, then you know you've got a real problem. I got, that, <laughs> I, I got that from one agency I worked with. Mm. It did not go well. <laughs> <laughs> I've learned any any words you bring up are fair game for them to pick on more. So you got better be careful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Make sure make sure you're confident about what you're asking about. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> just definitely. Throw it out there. <laughs> But, you know, it's like basic principles apply. So writing software is not a, a black art. It's common sense applies. So questions like, did it ever work? Are good questions to ask. Or did you change anything that made, and did you change anything and, and it stopped working after that? Mm -hmm. You know, they're not necessarily software questions. They're the questions you might ask if uh, somebody in your house told you the dishwasher wasn't working, you know? Well, yeah. what was the last thing you did before the dishwasher stopped working? You know, like, you oh, that's, a great, kind of. that's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. Did you put your laundry in there? You know, because um, <laughs> <laughs> that might have something to do with it. It would work, <laughs> it would work. <clears throat> yeah. So I, so I just threw in the chat a link to this Nginx unit thing, which is kind of like, mod pitch mod php for apache on steroids um <laughs> so it's kind of it's kind of cool if anyone needs this but it's like basically allows nginx to be built with uh language interpreters for like php python perl ruby all kinds of things java and so you can basically use nginx as an application server directly um as opposed to like most people use nginx currently run PHP FPM, so PHP FPM is its own like process of doing things, and then Nginx kind of proxies the web request to the FPM process and then gets a response. And in this case, it's actually executing directly within uh, kind of the core of Nginx, and it could do could do a bunch of interesting stuff. Um, but yeah, the fact that you could basically have this one server and then kind of just con configure it up and run like a bunch of different applications with different languages depending on like which request was coming in was kind of kind of interesting. Um, it it seemed like it was really like designed for very ADHD people who wanted like hyper dynamic configurability of all their stuff all the time. And yeah, mm -hmm. if you want like a super dynamic like application server mesh, this is this is the thing for you. Um, 
if that's not one of your life goals, maybe it's <laughs> a little a little more than you need. But yeah. um, to elaborate on that, the um, you know, if you're doing this with nginx and php fpm then um, handling transitions gracefully you sort of have to handle that at two levels um, mm. whereas with this you know if you're if you're scaling up or scaling down resources since it's all in one container but you know c- c- container is the wrong word because it's it's um it's not actually it's it's sort of it, it goes to the other extreme of things versus a, a Docker containerized solution. Um, but if you've got like one server that's got all this stuff, you've got Nginx unit with a bunch of um, resources running on it, you could scale it up and down um, and it would handle all of that graceful rescaling um, more easily because it's all managed by the one thing. So Nginx can say, oh, the connection on this has dropped, therefore I can since I can see the whole process, I can scale up or scale down without interrupting anybody's work. Um, so, in a like if you're doing a Docker container solution, you're sort of living in a world that's sort of the, the opposite of that, where you want things to be sort of more immutable so that you deploy something that you have tested in a certain way, you're confident. Um, you know, but you know, you could actually imagine using this as a um, and the, the capabilities that this has for dynamically scaling and reallocating um, things and for specifying your routes and all your route handling inside one configuration file that's, um, or one configuration endpoint that's dynamically configurable. Um, you could actually imagine putting that in front of um, a Kubernetes cluster or something like that. And you could have a really dynamic way of um, reallocating that um, that reverse proxy. Um, yeah. yeah. So it's there's some cool things, but um, yeah. I'm not sure it's um it, it's its utility was a little more limited than the advertising suggested. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, people haven't played with Nginx. It is a it is a good multi-purpose tool. Uh, probably I think someone was saying it's now maybe the most popular web server. Is that true? Mm-hmm. That's what uh, they said in the talk this morning. Yeah. Yeah. So, Peter, I have a follow-up question for you. You mentioned sure. uh, that Nginx uh, will, uh, depending on the language, it will uh, uh, translate or it will go to a specific location. Language as in uh, um, uh, spoken language or like a language as in uh, PHP or uh, Ruby, that kind of a language. Um, so yeah, so this application server kind of module. Uh, can interface with applications like in multiple different languages. I mean, I think you probably have to compile it in, uh, but like, so you could basically run a, have one application server and it would run like a Java application and it would run a PHP application and it would run a Ruby application. And you could have, let's say different paths or different ports on it. And the responses from those different paths or ports would come from the different applications, each written in a different language. And Uh it would all be in one thing. Right, so instead of running like Tomcat or Jetty to run your right. Java application as an application server, you would, um, you know, have this one thing, you know, and running PHP FPM to run the PHP part and running something else, you just, you know, spin up this one thing and it would know how to handle all, all of those. So, oh, interesting, interesting. Yeah. Can, can Nginx uh, also, uh... maybe this, I can uh, ask you this offline. Uh, more, I was uh, going to ask was, how can I uh, set up uh, subdomains in Nginx? Uh, I mean, yeah, you'd have to look at the Nginx docs. It, it, it's a very general okay. purpose web server and reverse oh, okay. proxy. So it can, it can do really anything and it's, yeah, it's very configurable. Um, so, you oh, know, good. you can kind of say like, hey, if I have this domain name coming in, then I handle it this way, like sending it to a PHP application and, you know, that's, that's, quite easy to do. And that's like, yeah, back when we were at Acquia, we were using Nginx for some of those things. Um, um, I think, yeah, with our with the BioRaft setup, everything's Nginx is inside a Docker container, which just needs to respond to a single host name. So that's not really an issue. But, but oh, yeah. Uh, Pana, it's worth noting too, that there's a distinction here between the Nginx 
uh, traditional core product and this Nginx unit. So the Nginx unit is the product that does this, um, that has modules for different programming languages and has the, the whole dynamically definable routing interface that um, Peter and I were describing first versus the mm -hmm. Nginx core, which um, you, know, you basically set up a configuration stanza for each thing, the server configuration then says, um, that this server responds to this host name or this mm -hmm. port or combination of things. Um, so you can sort of say, you know, listen to all interfaces and respond to this host name or listen on 